Richard Petty. Okay. From Randleman, North Carolina. Get back, okay? Known as the King because no other driver has ever won 180 stock car races or earned two and a half million dollars in prize money. For Richard, going to a race is as easy as putting on his boots. the second all-time winning driver with more super speedway victories than any other driver. David Pearson, a three-time Grand National Champion from Spartanburg, South Carolina, with earnings close to $2 million. I'll talk to you tonight. a Grand National Champion who earned more money in a single season than any other driver. At home in Timminsville, South Carolina, he's a county councilman. Buddy Baker from Charlotte, North Carolina. Another of racing's million dollar winners. The first man ever to drive 200 miles an hour on a closed course. And then he went fishing. California. Usually I'm somewhere among the top ten at the end of the Grand National Race. I haven't earned a million dollars in racing, but I won the Talladega 500 one year, and I'm not about to make winning any easier for the other guys. Make sure you check in the morning at seven, and we'll see you. This is Junie Dunleavy, the owner of car number 90, the car I race.
put this set of scuffs on it. I've been driving for Junie Donlevy for a couple of years on the Grand National Circuit. That'll give you a chance to find it whether it be losing. 30 races a season from California to Florida with the richest prize money in auto racing and millions of fans. If you don't get hooked up with a draft in that, we won't know what we're doing anyway. But we got a three and a quarter again. So why get our end? Junie and I work hard to get close to winning combination. Well, but we can't match a Petty or a Yarborough or a Pearson for the amount of money they spend in winning. And we're not making excuses, but to win the big money, like $63,000 top prize at Daytona, you've got to spend it. Chasing that winning combination is big business. The only thing stock about cars today is the shape. The rest of it is specially designed for racing. In the early days of racing, we're short on money, but long on action. These cars were really stock cars with back seats and radios and ashtrays and, and maybe even a heater. Women drivers? Why, shoot. They had them back then, and they were bashing fenders just like the men. A winning combination then was a Hudson Hornet, a pit crew of good old boys from a used car lot and the ability to survive just about anything. At this museum in Darlington, South Carolina, there's plenty of racing history, old cars and memories and trophy cases. And these four gentlemen were driving when stock car racing was just a kid. I guess I'm the only driver in the history of the NASCAR that ever run a monkey in my car. Jocko was the monkey, and Tim Flock is one of a family of race drivers from the 1950s and a Grand National Champion. Buck Baker is Buddy Baker's father, one of the toughest early racers, another Grand National Champion who even races a little now. And qualifying on this on this second lap, this daggone seagull hit right on the right side there and just caved a bit of the windshield out and went on back in the back there and. I made Buddy clean it out. <laughs> I told him that was his car. <coughs> he said, man, I want you to know he still gives me hell about that today. They had no reason to caution because I was out of notion. Ned and, Jarrett, uh, anyway, a steady, hard competitor from the 1950s and early 60s. Another Grand National champion. The race cars, and I fell across that flying string and passed out. And the next thing I remembered, I was laying in some big fat woman's arm, and she had about a half a pint of early times trying to get me to uh, <laughs> to take a drink and, and uh, he got I like had he a little bit of blood it. on me and uh, I thought I was dying, you know, and I said, Lord, that's the last thing I want to drink a liquor because I didn't want to, want to take my chances of going to heaven and, and being half drunk. Cotton Owens, a former top driver who puts his years of racing experience into building race cars What's today. What's happening out there? He says, how is it in there? I said, it's real good. He said, you get out here and change tires and let me drive. <laughs> <laughs> Back a while, and it was long about the, when they first started running here at Darlington. And it was, the fact of business is in this old horse right here, I think. Everybody had a different ideas about uh, what it would take to survive 500 miles. Some of them even put black underneath the eyes like football players, and some had lemon juice and different uh, different types of liquid, you know, to, to drink while they run 500 miles. Nobody had been 500 miles. You had so I juice. had tomato juice in mine. And that red, tomato juice. red tomato juice. Yeah, red tomato <laughs> juice. I guarantee you. When, when I hit that car, it just it busted the, the uh, thermos jug and just splattered all over me and all over the old car. And that guy thought I just ruined it. Blood, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he said, this son of cut his head off. I heard, I heard a little <laughs> bit further than that. I actually got out of the car. I actually got out of the car. He started walking across the infield and said the women could see him coming, had a white driver's uniform with the tomato juice all over his helmet and splashed all over him. And some of the women actually just passed out in the infield as he walked back. <laughs> the greatest thing was about racing back then was uh, we had our automatic parts departments. All we had to do was go out in the infield and we'd get that part because we were running strictly stock back then. Run to the announcer and tell him to announce anybody this model automobile, I need a fan belt or a water pump or a carburetor or whatever. Made a 16 second pit stop back then, you didn't get anything. You didn't even get a drink of water if you made it. 
16 second pit stop back then. I know if you if you got in at 30, 35, 40 seconds, where well, you had Talk a, about many sergeants. Right. <laughs> yeah, we had a first class crew. Well, in 1950, uh, I was sitting on the jack out there when uh, Walt Crawford, I believe it was, spun old 49 Buick, and they were changing my tires. One <laughs> took the tire off the wheel, put the tire back on that wheel, pumped it up, and put it back on the car. You could get, you could I finished seventh. You could get out of your car. I finished seventh. You could get out of your car and uh, go over to the stand, get you a drink, maybe a hot dog, and come back and get in your car, and they'd still be tight in the luggage. If you made one, I guess, in, in maybe a minute or so then, my, you were considered pretty lucky because they didn't have a, a regular guy to go to the racetrack shoot. I'd go to drug stores and barber shops, beer joints, anywhere else, they had overalls on and everything else. Just pick up anybody that wanted to go to the race, he'd get him in free. Well, he'd work on the car, you know. I have my best year in 55 with TK. I won 18 Grand Nationals and stood for 12 years. Petty was the only guy that ever come back to win more than 18 races in one year. But uh, we won about $64,000 in 1955. Uh, if I could go out in 1977 and win 18 Grand Nationals, uh, I would win probably 300 to 400 thousand dollars. So, and if you got to keep it all, that'd be. Oh man, I'd quit. <laughs> <laughs> Daytona again. We took a modified down to the beach and didn't have a roll bar in the car. And I asked him, "Do we run without the roll bar?" And he said, "Well, if they tell you you got to have a roll bar, you got to have one." I said, "What if we put a wooden roll bar in the car?" And we won the race with a wooden roll bar. The next morning, Daytona Beach. Headlines, Tim Flock disqualified with a wooden roll bar. <laughs> did, did you not think about your own safety as far as those wooden roll bars? Well, we had, uh, Ned, we had been running without roll bars, and we didn't even know what a roll bar was. This is 49, 1949, way back there. And uh, I never had been upside down in the car. Now I can see what NASCAR was trying to do, but back then we didn't. We were on that first place money, which we didn't get. You know, as you get older, you get smarter. Like someone said, uh, your hindsight is 100%. <laughs> you know, if we could go back with what we got in our minds today to 1950s or something like that, it would be entirely a different show. The sanctioning body for Grand National Racing is NASCAR. And that's short for the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. And this ex-Marine is Bill Gazaway. And he's the man from NASCAR who keeps us honest. 14 to Jack Houston. I'm the Grand National Competition Director. It encompasses a great deal of things. Uh, I have to look out for everything that happens at the speed limit. You gotta have somebody that's gotta look out for the safety of everybody. This is the one thing that we at NASCAR work on, probably more so than anything else. The safety is our prime interest. That lays out all the rules and regulations that are required in order to compete at one of our events. Now, the first thing we do is the inspectors take a look at your car to make sure that the car meets all of our safety standards. And then we can start checking it to see that it meets all the regulations in the rule book. Bud Moore's been building race cars for about 25 years and running him through tech inspection for just about as long. He owns car number 15 and Buddy Baker drives it. The engines in our car, number 90, are built at Bud's garage in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Well, when we first get to the racetrack, they check the cubic inches on the engine, make sure that the engine is uh, under 358 cubic inches. Then we go over and start through tech. On a NASCAR Grand National car that runs the 30 race Winston Cup Series, the car has got to weigh 3,700 pounds. That's full of fuel, less the driver. Now, a car gets caught going through tech inspection that weighs less than 3,700 pounds, and he's got to add enough ballast to the car to make sure that the car weighs 3,700 pounds. Uh, Bill Gasway, a uh, guy wouldn't want to have his job and try to keep uh, all these guys honest that uh, he's had to put up with. I know. Uh, just taking my own operation alone that uh, with all the stuff we try to do to the car and try to get through with, then uh, if all of them are doing the same thing, he's got a hell of a job on his hand.
We're not really in conflict with any of the NASCAR inspectors. These people have got a job to do, and uh, they, they know what their rules are and the way the rules are written. We know how they're written and all this stuff, so we try to go to the limits on all the rules. It doesn't make any difference what rule they come out with and all the car owners and mechanics. Hard time. We keep the inspectors on their toes. Tell me when. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll do something real obvious to the car that will help the car in the event uh, we might do 20 little things to the car that we'll cheat a little more on here and there, and then uh, the inspector may catch 10 of them, then we got 10 of them to the good. Buddy Baker is a good race driver. Uh, we work real well together, and uh, we've had our downfall the time or two, but uh, he understands me, and I understand him. And uh, when he comes in off the racetrack, and uh, he tells me what he feels like the car is doing and problems he's having, and uh, he knows he's not talking. Buddy Baker, Auto Rugby, is now switching heading for the lead. Buddy Buck Baker, uh, Buddy's father, drove me in 1956, 57, 58, and then along come Buddy, uh, picked up where his daddy left off, and uh, it's sort of generation after generation. Well, Bud's from the old school. He built my dad's car when he was national champion. When I moved in, uh, he never even changed the name. He called my dad Baker, and he called me that. It's a hard thing to put your finger on because there's so many elements involved. A man realizes that a car is capable of doing so much, a crew is capable of doing so much, and he's capable of doing so much and doesn't win. And he'll just have to try another day. Into the straightaway engine. Race with Bennett because Yalbar appears an old cluster at the front. I don't think there's any such thing as a perfect race driver. Even the best make mistakes. They make less mistakes. It looks like Baker was sorted to a slide, but all on the track from a blown engine. Plenty of action in the pitch now. Here comes the narrow water in the green. Next one's in car number 90. But it might have in car number 15. Uh, have 10 employees here that uh, work here in the shop building cars and building parts and pieces and engines and all for our number 15 car for a 30 race schedule besides uh, all the engines and stuff that we build and ship all over the world to other people. We started the 351 Cleveland engine and racing in 1972 and we've been working with it ever since and uh, there's been a lot of races won with this engine and uh, we pioneered this engine. It's along the same way as Junior Johnson pioneered the little small block engines that's running in the Chevrolet. They primarily built the same, but for cylinder head designs and all this here, and combustion chamber designs and all, there's quite a bit of difference. So, uh, for setting one engine again, the other one, uh, you just had to set one one way and the other in the other way so that uh, you would come out with good horsepower and good readings on it so it'd make a racing. shop, a racing engine is put together like a watch. It not only has to produce speed, but it's got to be strong to last for 500 miles at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. It gets pushed to the limits, and if it wins or loses, it's inspected and detailed records are kept. Without this kind of precision and care, you can't win on the Grand National Circuit. It went awful good. It's been a long time. 
the dynamometer, we check the carburetion, the fuel mixture, and we know just exactly uh, how the fuel mixture and the burn is on the engine, the power and everything before we put it in the car. Well, it's pulling awful good on the bottom end. Uh, we'll have to check the torque all the way out. But, uh, The engine's in good shape. It pulls good horsepower and all before we leave here to the races. Quite frankly, when I was younger, I was too wild. I ran too hard. My dad said, you can give me an amble at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'd have it broke at 12.30. Took a long time and, and a, a lot of thought behind it to understand that winning the race is a team effort. I won the fishing derby here one time. Uh, a little over 10 pounds. I didn't need but one and pay it for the biggest fish. Uh, when I go fishing, I can come down here and, and it's complete quiet. It's just uh, my boat, a fishing rod. Uh, on occasion, it's a real good friend that you enjoy being around. Oh, crappy! Ah! <laughs> Look at that crappy! <laughs> a flame crappy of all things to catch. <laughs> That's pretty good crappy. Well, when I was 17 years old, I went to my dad and told him I wanted to drive a race car. If I had a problem, I had to live in for a, you know, I could sit down at the dinner table with my dad and discuss it. Like I asked him what it felt like to turn a race car over, and he said, you just keep doing it, you'll find out. Real good day. It's foggy and hazy this morning. It looks like the school fish are really going to school good. Kale Yarbrough drives a Chevrolet, and not too many other drivers have the kind of intensity he has. The year he said he wanted to win the Grand National Championship, he did it. During practice, a driver starts getting a feel for the car and how he sets it up. Setting a car up really means uh, tuning in the chassis to, to a particular racetrack. And, uh, by this, we mean that uh, we have to change the springs around, uh, different springs on different uh, wheels. Coming out for practice laps in car number 11, driven by Cam Yarbrough, the pride of Timmonsville, South Carolina. I was born and raised uh, in Forest County and around Timmonsville, and uh, when I decided to run for county council, these people took me serious, and when they went to the polls, they proved this. 11-15. County council in Florence County runs the entire county. They handle all the financing. We have to look after all the, the roads in the county and uh, ditching problems, drainage problems, uh, Everything that, that comes up in the county. You know, I change hats from day to day. I, when I go to the racetrack, I put on my helmet. When I come, come home, I put on my business hat and uh, try to tend to the business as it, as it comes along. 
Dale Yarbrough drove his first Grand National race here at Darlington when he was 17. Four years under the legal age. Three times the officials took him out of his Pontiac during the race. And when he sneaked in behind the wheel for the fourth time, he hit the wall before they saw him again. One thing for sure, even as a teenager, he didn't like losing. I have never in my life gone into a race thinking that I was going to finish second. I'm just not satisfied with, with anything but first. I'm a poor loser. I don't like to lose, and uh, I don't intend to lose any more than I get. I love competition. I think the name of the game is racing instead of riding. The race starts when the green flag falls, and it's over when the checkered falls. I think that the people in the grandstands pay to see a man run hard all day. This is the way that I started racing. It's the way I like to race, and the sponsors that uh, pay the bills, like to see their car up front, so this is the way I do it. Sometimes it's probably cost me a race or two along the line, but uh, I think that the fans will be able to say that uh, he gave us our money's worth, and that's what, that's what I'm after. And to the 90th Junior Johnson owns car number 11. He burned up the track in his day and expects the same flat out driving from Kale. When uh, they dropped the green flag, I got a job to do. I felt the same way when I was driving. My job then was to beat everybody else. My job now is to help kill beat everybody else. And it's basically the same thing. I do find myself trying to figure out if Kale's got problems. What happened when I had them problems as a driver. You know, what's the best thing for him to do under the circumstance he's running on? So everybody that's ever drove for us, if he did not pick up on that attitude of our racing team, he didn't stay there very long. Kill basically is our type of driver. He charges some time ago. I never started out to do anything, halfway do anything I've done in racing. I wanted to be the best. And everybody can't be winners, and I understand that. But I want, you know, my part of to be the best that, that I can produce for. And, you know, when I get to where I don't feel that way about it, I'll, I'll just do something. Well, I built my first soapbox derby when I was 10 years old, and I uh, ran two years. I ran down the hill in Darlington, uh, I lost both years, so I realized then if I was going to do anything in the racing business, I had to have some horsepower. and everybody concerned. This, this Sonny Farm Chevrolet just ran perfect, Ned, all day long. The engine ran strong. We got the best engine man in the business. Of course, Herb Neb, the chassis man, the car worked perfect, and it's just absolutely a great day for us. <laughs> it was a tough one, I'll tell you. You know, when you get so far behind, sometimes you say, well, one of it's worth trying to go on, but you find out today, just never say quit, you know, it won't happen. Will Ed and Agree please come to the garage office for a phone call? A half hour remains so, for practice. Practice means setting up a car. And Junie and I, like the rest of the teams, do a lot of tinkering to get the car to handle just right. If we could get that time back on these tires this time of day, we'd still be pretty good. Because there hasn't been anybody running any faster than that today. 
Car number 72 is a Chevrolet driven by Benny Parsons, who won the Grand National Championship in 1973. Even though Benny doesn't like running against the clock, there's more than one reason for qualifying the fastest. Winning a pole means anywhere from $500 to $10,000, depending on the track. I'm trying to put more emphasis on qualifying because I realize now that uh, it sets the tempo for the entire weekend. It sets the tempo for Sunday and you do it as early as Wednesday at some racetracks. We need to get that shot where we can qualify up one, two, three, four, someplace in there, so that uh, not only I get pumped up and excited about the oncoming race, but uh, the mechanics, the engine people, everybody gets, you try to get everybody excited and, and let them realize that we have an excellent opportunity to win. coming off and I know the tires is going to take it out for qualifying and I don't want to get it pushed. I was going to say we don't want to get it to push. Right, I don't want it to push. It's a little, you know, that's... It Getting shows. the car ready for qualifying is uh, we have to get the car ready to run two laps and that makes a great deal of difference. Uh, there's several things that we can do. We can run different springs because we're only running two laps. A 40. What time is shutting off practice? Looks like they're fixed to do it. I got two different sets of tires. Two sets of tires. One of them, the car's loose as a goose. But on the other set, it never turns. Just goes straight ahead. Well, I can't use used tires here. Oh, you need new ones. That's right. Well, well, that's so started, too. Right, right. Qualifying. Yeah, three o'clock. Right. 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 First on the speed is car number 65, driven by Jerry Hansen. And qualifying, you are running against a clock only. It's an invisible barrier. If there's other cars out there, it's no problem. You, you know, you can adjust with how they're backing off or how they're entering the corners or how they're coming off the corners and, and try to pass them. But there's no way that you can do anything with the clock, the invisible barrier. You sit out there and you say, well, I need to go in a little deeper. And when you do, you're in too deep. I need to get on a little quicker. When you do, you're on it. Uh, too quick when I said, well, I, I won't get on so quick, and then you're late getting back in the trunk. You back off too early. It's very, very hard to, to beat the clock. Alvino 
North Carolina. David Pearson, the man who has won more super speedway races than any other Grand National driver in history. Driving the car on the track is his son, Ricky. They're preparing for a baby Grand race usually held on Saturday, the day before the big Grand National race. Having David Pearson set up a car is a little like having Joe Namath teach you how to throw a football. David's other son, Larry, also drives in the baby Grand races. Uh, both of them runs uh, Capri on, on the Minister. You know, the small cars, Capris, the Mustangs, and I own Rickers, and uh, of course I wish somebody else did own it. I got a lot of money in it. I got just as much money in that one as I do my sports car. Of course, uh, I feel like it, uh, you know, to build a car and build it safe, you got to have a lot of money in it, and uh, that's the only way I want him running. So uh, I went to a little extra, I guess, and extreme trying to build a car right. And of course, it just costs more when you do that. My father, he's very smart about these cars. He's been a long time. You know, he's the one that puts all the money into it, and he knows what's best for the car. And now, you know, I mean, he'll step back and watch us. If we do something right, you know, fine, okay, but if we do it wrong, he'll adjust us to that thing. You got to learn a lot about racing. He's got to learn what makes this do that, and whatever. And it's really hard. But if you, you know, really like racing, you can, you know, you can learn. Everybody's got to start somewhere. And uh, if, you know, we're not getting any younger, so we've got to have some younger guys coming in, you know, to come on up into Grand Nationals. And I think it's a good way to, for the boys to get started. The sports writers like to call David Pearson the Silver Fox because a lot of times he drives just behind the leader waiting for a mistake. And when it comes, the Fox wins. If Ricky and Larry drive like their father, a winning combination will pass from one generation to the next. Ever since they were born, you know, they've been racing. They, they would race at anything they do, even eating. But I even uh, carried them a ride one time when I was at Darlington on tire test and just scared the hound out of them, you know, hoping that they wouldn't want to get in the car. Then they always said, no, they wouldn't be a race car driver. But that didn't last too long. When they got uh, older, they uh, decided then they wanted to go racing. No, I think uh, me and brother both really love racing. You know, my father has a sportsman car, and we go with him, you know, usually on weekends, but he's not running grand national racing. And, uh, we learn a lot there. You can call them bull rings, outlaw tracks, or whatever. Top drivers like David Pearson often take a late model sportsman car to a track like this. It's kind of wild, but it's close to what stock car racing was like years ago. And it's a good place to learn. Here in Mobile, Alabama, David had Ricky and Larry to help him. But the ending wasn't quite what they had hoped for. When I started, nobody had me. I had to do everything myself. I even worked on the cars myself. and didn't know anything about mechanic repair. Just get right in there and do it. And even when I was real small and had a little motorbike on rainy days, I'd tear that thing apart. I'd take something off and put it back together, you know, and see if it would run and learn to put it together that way. I think you enjoy more doing it. Respect, you know. You just appreciate what you got more that way. I'm sure that they appreciate anything I tell them. They try to listen. I feel like if, if they do decide to race for a living, I believe they'll be pretty good.
get you in the back. Yeah, you want to die? No. Lord, I thought you might need it. Might make it run a little faster. That was the, was the plain old country boy, what you want to call it, you know. Uh, that's where I was raised and brought up to be. And uh, racing has been good to me, and uh, I owe everything that I got to racing. In a few seconds, David is going to have to make an instant decision to either hit the brakes or hit the throttle to avoid a collision. There's nobody perfect, and you are going to wreck. And I'm sure that wouldn't, you know, and it's not going to be the last time. Uh, you just can't look at that one. You can't look at the bad side of it. You have to look at the good side. Still been leading the race. He was leading the race at the time, but, but uh, he, if he would have pitted, we could have got him in that. He'd still been in front. But the way he done it, he run an extra lap, and waiting on the caution car to slow down. That was a mistake on his part, which he didn't know. He just learned it. That takes experience. The longer he runs, the more he can find these things out. So uh, that was just a mistake there. 
There will be plenty of action in the ship now. I think it's falls quicker than mine. I could beat him through the corners, but down the straightaway, I could beat him coming off the corners. And there was only two or three laps left, so you know, I couldn't back off. And I went into the corner. There was two or three cars there. Well, I felt like crying. My feelings were hurting, you know, mostly I was. You know, my father does, you know, he put a lot of work in the car. But then he came up to the window of the car and asked me, was I all right? And I said, yeah. He said, don't worry about it. You just showed him you weren't scared. You just took a run with him. And uh, the car can always be fixed back. Now it's Sunday, the day of the race. All the cars are pushed to the line and the rules say no more tampering with a car by the crew. The car is either ready to race or it isn't. And without a good pit crew, you can't run up front, much less win. And unlike most crews that get paid for working, well, our crew, as Junie can tell you, is a little unusual. We found out that together, we could all form a pretty good team. But uh, individually, we, we didn't have a whole lot going for it. When you run against Petties and Yarbers and they have a lot of money behind them, it makes it pretty tough. But we feel like we've done a real good job with the guys coming in at night working and being at the racetrack on weekends, and we have no paid members whatsoever. And all of the guys just enjoy the racing. The other teams, they uh, they haven't quite figured out what we've got yet, because no, you know, there's no other team on the circuit made up like ours. But each one of these guys have, have stayed real late at night when we've had problems. And never once do they ever say, well, that's good enough. They always try to do that. Well, our picker has been working together for a long time. They know they can pull off a quick pit stop, and I know it. But they're always aware of the whole race, of what's happening all the time. Now, my job is driving a car, finding the fastest groove and staying there. But they're charting my lap times, or keeping track of the gas in the car, and are checking a number of laps on the tires and watching the flow of the race. They know when I should pit before I do, and Junie brings me in. real good for us because 
couple of years ago, he owned his own car. And Brooks had run for some good teams that had a lot of money. But by Brooks owning his own car, he understands the problems that we have with money. If something happens, uh, if he demolishes the car, we'll, we're in business for quite a while. Where Yarborough or Allison, they know that they've got a car to replace it as soon as we get back to the shop. He wants to take that extra chance. Every now and then, we do run flat out. Like at Talladega, we did lose a car. Brooks was running second right with uh, with Baker, and he was as fast as anything on the track. But we demolished the car. One of them tried to get in a little too quick and kind of touched it in the rear quarter panel and got me a little bit sideways. And when it did, the car just started flying. I can remember saying to myself, my God, this is going to be bad. All I know is when it gets up in the air like that, it gets kind of quiet and lonesome. And But the same crew that we have right now came over and worked night and day and had the car ready for Dover, which was only about a month later. And Brooks ran second with the same car. This is Richard Donlevy, Junie's son, and Kenneth Bell in the Donlevy garage in Richmond, Virginia. Baker got in front of the 28 car. The 28 car came up behind Baker just like he was going to fill in for the draft. So he can grab that wind. When he did, he clipped Brooks. Brooks said he got just a little bit sideways, this way, and then he come back this way, and he said when he come back that way, he hit that mud, and when he did, he said it went up about 20 feet in the air, and uh, then when he finally come down, come down nose first and climbed back, 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 over and over like that. Then he came to a screeching home down there by those little record trucks. <laughs> Plenty enough to tear the car up real bad, as you can see. It was a terrible wreck. I believe um, that wreck, and the wreck that Allison uh, came through with there, that uh, I believe it was at Rockingham, they had to be the two worst wrecks uh, that have, have been around in the last five years. Neither driver got any serious injuries. Yeah, neither one, neither one. Well, like Brooks, he was a muddy mess, but he came right out the windshield and walked away. He got in his personal car and drove all the way back to Spartanburg that night, so we were talking to him on the CB on the way home. We really don't care to remember that much <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> driver can walk away from a wreck like this. Steel bars form a roll cage around him, and he's strapped in so tight, he can barely move anything but his arms and legs. And that net on the window keeps his head and arms inside the car during a wreck. The chance of a fire is reduced by using a special fuel cell. Head of the field, we got the darn engine blue with about 100 laps to go. I believe that was the best shot we ever had. You know, that when the reporter figured we'd go in, yeah. they'd have moved up there. They'd yeah. moved the camera crew and everything right away <laughs> where we were, man. They That's would run us when they moved that up. They were ready for Victory Circle, right there. <laughs> we put on clean uniforms and everything. <laughs> <laughs> we was ready. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad year, man. We have a bad year for wreck, bad year for engines. Next year ought to be a good year for everything. You couldn't hire the crew that we have for 100,000 a year with the amount of work that they do. We've had no mechanical problems over the last three years. Not one thing has ever fallen off that owner.
AT&T and t and While the race fans are arriving and getting settled and the band is playing, there's a meeting going on that the fans never see. Right, this, this won't take but a couple minutes. The driver introduction is at 12.05 at the start-finish line, everybody in uniform. Try to be on time. One thing I'd like to caution all you drivers about, a lot of rubbing going on down here, so caution yourselves going in and out of the pits. We're going to run the caution car today approximately 60 miles an hour to give everybody a chance to make a good pit stop. But I want you fellas to back off of this thing because it's very underpowered. Now, let me get it out there. If you belong to go around it, I'll put you around it, but you wait till I put you around it. Just give us an opportunity. We'll straighten it out before we restart the race. <laughs> well, now, Lenny, that's not the way I hear it. I hear a little different tale. Anybody from the other ranks want to speak up that one? Richard Petty. If there's any driver with the best grip on the winning combination, it's got to be him. Petty works longer and harder at winning than just about any other driver. And when it comes to luck, he doesn't just fall into it. He makes it. His record of over 180 wins and number 43 speaks for itself. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any problems out there? All day long. Uh, we cut a couple of tires down early and got behind, and uh, the last time I just wore one out. Here, everybody knows us as, you know, as Richard Petty or Linda Petty, who used to go to school and grew up here, not as Richard Petty, the race car driver. And it's not like that if we moved into a new place or a bigger town or something like that. I guess a couple of years ago, and we just formed a band at the school, and uh, they were needing new uniforms and everything, and they wanted to know how to make up, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars right quick. And so, you know, I told them, well, we'd, you know, we would have an open house and see if we could take up some money, and you know, see if they could help pay for the uniforms. Then this past year, uh, we decided to have it again, and uh, most of the money this time went to the athletic fund at the high school. And when we have open house, help the community part of it, but uh, it's for the fans and stuff to get to go through the whole, the whole shot. Right out of the middle, then, and just, and just, and just, and just do it, and just do it from end to end. That'd be good enough. Because if we don't, we're gonna have we're gonna have wall to wall sticks. <laughs> they know that it's not a deal that the man just works on his car in the backyard and brings it to the race on Sunday and then goes on Monday and goes and does something else. It, it shows just how big a business it is. Uh, I myself just enjoyed, you know, seeing all that many people and seeing that there's that many people interested in racing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. Oh, we got the steaks, the yard. We got good place to fix it. Is Mike going to fix the place for me to see it, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Virginia, Morty Roger on all of the people from uh, the north, and we're going to have the gates open. Guarantee we've got a lot in store for you for today. We're going to have a good time. Do you want to meet Richard? Do you know who our guests are for today? we got five past Grand National Champions, also a couple of the top drivers, uh, Lee Fine and Cecil Gordon will be with us today. We have Ned Jarrett. We have uh, Daryl Derringer, we have Buck Baker, and we got uh, Tim Flock, 
And all of these guys are going to be in signing autographs. Today we have the car sitting inside of Richard so you can take pictures and uh, get a chance to get a handshake. And uh, hey, by the way, we're setting up the dartboards over here. Now I want to tell you about this thing. We got a dartboard set up with a David Pearson car on it. We have permission. We're going to tour the home. Have you ever seen a football field? How long is it? Marty Roger, you're going to see a house today that's 103 yards. We're going to give you a tour. Got the vans all set up. Linda's daddy, my, my daddy-in-law, was the one that really did all the construction on the house. So we were more enthusiastic on building the house that way than we would if we would have done the contract. But, uh, you know, the fans and stuff were, you know, very enthusiastic about seeing the house. And of all the fans in the world of any kind of thing, I think they get more involved with the racing people than they do with uh, football players or baseball players. They're more interested in what they do at home and how they do in family because a lot of your uh, people that go to racing and stuff go as family units. A lot of times, it's just a nice, comfortable, livable room. If you don't mind them rough happening, they can have a pajama party out here, whatever. We can go back in the back to the bedroom and we never hear them, which works out real good. They can stay up all night. That makes it good. That's all the machine shop part of the thing over there. That's where we do all the cheating, I guess. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> I do a bunch of driving and stuff. Like this. This is pretty good. Well, this year I had changed since I was here five years ago. Well, you better believe it. Yeah. This is really cool. We do a lot of racing right in this section. We got all the roll bar tubing and all the sheet metal and all this stuff. That's, that's the way the cars look before we put the bodies on them. It's really ready to race. We make it race weather just like that. Yeah, it's not really finished, but the basic uh, basic race cars are all they got to do now is just finish it up. And this is where the whole deal is. If you start over yonder, you build the car right, you go build the motor right come back and put the car together right, then this is what you get in results. This is this is what it's all about, is when it's all over with that uh, you can go home with a trophy and the money because uh, after all, we're out there to, to try to win races. So this is, my father's trophies are right straight in there, most of them. He's got, still got some of them now. But uh, all the rest of them are the ones that, that we've been able to collect over 17, 18 years. never even anticipated winning, uh, you know, any 180 races or, or a million dollars or anything like that. It was just something that when I first started driving, I drove because I like to drive, and I still drive because I like to drive. The times are so much different now than what they were when my father was doing it. Racing is so much bigger. It's, it's a big business now. You know, there's millions of dollars invested in racing. I tell you, I'm, I must be odd, <laughs> but I never had the butterflies the first time I ever crawled in a race car. I think from time to time I've probably had races that I was more anxious to get in or stay away from. You know what I mean? But as far as the butterfly deals, I don't think that I've, I've, uh, I've ever really had that trouble. I know some of the boys that get sick and can't eat before the race or stuff like that. You know? You know, I can lay down right beside the race car and go to sleep, and it don't bother me. I can, if they wake me up and put me in the car, I'm ready to go. disappointed when I don't win than I am excited when I do win. And I think that the boys, Dale, Morris, and Wade, all the boys that work on the car feel the same way. You know, we don't go into the race and expect to do anything but win. And if we don't win, then we're disappointed. If we do win, then we just feel like it was done the job that we were supposed to do. Go!
and they got me driving instead of working on it. <laughs> From my standpoint, I'm doing a job, and my job is driving a race car. And another one of my jobs is to sell racing. I like people, and uh, so uh, I don't have that much trouble, you know, keeping enthusiasm up because the people that come up to me, they generate enthusiasm, so then it just rubs off on me. Your motor a lot, don't you? I tell you what, Richard. No, I tell you what. She was born in March of last year, and she was uh, down. <laughs> oh, you started early, didn't you? Yes, People ask, you know, what does it take to be a race car driver? Every race car driver I know is is 150 degrees from the other kit. You know, I don't think anybody has got any more drive to drive a race car than K L and B. You talk to Pearson or me, you get exactly the opposite of that. Yeah, it's there when they get ready to call me and I'll go drive the thing. And all of us are winners. So, you know, what does it take? That's all I have. Have a nice race. Some drivers will say that a woman doesn't belong in a Grand National race car. It weighs about 3,700 pounds, and after wrestling with it for 500 miles, you've sweated away about 10 pounds, and your eyes feel like cotton. But this woman, Janet Guthrie, just doesn't agree. I started racing in 1963, uh, about two and a half years after I got out of college. I had bought a, a Jaguar, uh, seven years old at that time. I uh, found out what I could do with it, Gymkhana's, field trials, hill climbs. After a couple of seasons of that, I bought another Jaguar that had been set up for the race circuit and campaigned that car for five years. Built my first engine, uh, put it together in the back of the station wagon after pulling the engine in an unheated, unlit uh, barn using a set of flat wrenches. But the engine that I, I built that spring, uh, the first engine I ever put together with my own hands went 13 races in 1964, including the first ever 500 miler at Watkins Glen, in which I finished sixth overall. But I don't have to wait till they're all bunched up, as long as the pace car is on the track and circulating. You can see no, you you need need to see the pace car. car. If you can't see it, don't come in. Go chase you need to see either the leaders or the pace car before you get The minute the green flag comes down, one is concentrating exclusively on what's going on the track and how to do it faster and better. Uh, how the track is changing, where the grease is, where the slippery spots are, how the line is changing, how the light on the track is changing that affects how you perceive it, who's in front of you that you are trying to pass, and what are the flaws in their driving technique that enable you to pass them, uh, who's behind you, and uh, how far behind is it perhaps a leader for whom you will yield the track, or is it somebody with whom you're scrambling for a position uh, to whom you're not going to give an inch. Pearson is still in the lead. Janet has been running well today as a raceman. Why do I race? Certainly I find racing life enhancing. It, it contributes immensely to your enjoyment of all the rest that life has to offer. I started out in life to be an aerospace engineer, and slowly but surely, racing took over my life. It represents just, you know, more than, more than I could have dreamed of. It's something that certainly wouldn't have happened 10 years ago before the women's movement had such a strong effect. The women's movement created the opportunity. I guess I was ready for it. 
just about half an hour from the end of the race, and I was running eighth at that time, and um, I, I felt something that felt as if a tire and an inner liner both had gone completely flat. And I came roaring into the pits, pointing at all four tires at once. The poor car, I was beating on it. I was beating on the steering wheel. It doesn't do any good, of course, to vent one's frustrations on a, a, an inanimate object, a mechanical object. They told me to drive it on into the garage area. I could not understand that because I, I imagined I simply had a flat tire, but uh, of course when I got in, I, I found the, uh, the left rear tire leaning in at the top. It was the, the uh, rear axle housing which had snapped, and that was the end of the race. When you've been in racing as long as I have, this last year has been my 14th season. You know basically that that's racing, and uh, stoicism is uh, certainly the only uh, possible uh, approach to this situation. So after the uh, initial shock uh, wears off, why well, you just shrug your shoulders and accept it, because that's all there is uh, to do. Next time, perhaps, luck will come your way instead of going against you. Bobby Allison is another million dollar winner in a Grand National Racing. And here at the Riverside, California road course, Bobby is going to run a new car. It's his own. Most of the top drivers race a car that belongs to someone else and get a percentage of the prize money. Owning and driving his car means all the problems are on his shoulders. Got a new crew, he's got a new sponsor, and an untested car. But Bobby has won here three times out of the last six years. His new Matador will get a tough test on the only road course on the circuit. It's a twisting, weaving, two and seven tenths mile road course where speeds range from 45 miles an hour on the turns to 175 miles an hour on the straightaways. Charlie, we need to have a reliable time next time I go out. Oh, in high gear, it's turned about 7,200 around the corner. Well, most of the uh, very top teams have a car owner and a chief mechanic and a driver. And Where's your lowest? 
you know, all these things are pretty well separated. I just really enjoy being involved. It requires more concentration and everything, but uh, it's a very enjoyable situation, especially when things are going pretty well for you. Yeah, the sound is, is on, which I think when we change the pipes, we'll see a difference there. I have my idea of what a winning combination is, you know, a good car and a good driver and a good crew and uh, good luck. For instance, uh, you see the major team show up at the racetrack and an engine blow all apart. Everybody stands back and their eyes get big, and why did that happen, you know? The molecules were not situated properly in a certain piece of metal, or an air bubble went through the oil system. If you really reviewed the whole situation, maybe one time when they all went right, they shouldn't have, and you just got lucky. It's a great flag to stand. scramble to uh, put the Matador race car together and the team together, my engine man just uh, failed to check the clearances and boom, filed it. Well, it didn't hurt, it caught on fire, it burned the floor pretty good. The paint off, but it didn't hurt anything else, bent the spoiler back when I went off the track. But I got it sideways and that moved fire. Possibly even if we'd have warmed the oil that morning, you know, with, a, with an oil warmer. Uh, we might have been into a situation where uh, we could have lucked out and got by. Riverside's history. We're going to Daytona. Well, this is it the Daytona International Speedway, the big one. If a driver wins here, he not only wins a lot of money, but he wins a certain kind of recognition that isn't the same anywhere else in racing. The 135,000 people will be watching, and millions more on TV. And during the four hours of racing here, Junie and I and the crew will discover if we've done everything right.
Roll them. Let's go. A driver, six crew members, and about 2,000 parts fastened together over four tires. If you win, everybody did everything right. And if you lose, somebody did something wrong or something unexpected happened. Victory Lane is big enough for only one car, and all the rest go home as losers.